Hi, my name is Dr. Ben Newman, and I study coronaviruses for a living. Um, and I'm going to try to answer your questions uh, based on, yeah, a lifetime of studying coronaviruses. Uh, next question is from Mark. Hello, Mark. All right, it's a long one. Uh, let's look at it. So the research work, and it's on the computer behind me. That's why I'm looking over you at the moment. Research work down at the Wuhan labs seems risky. I can see why any virology work might seem risky if you looked at it in a certain light. But if you look at it in another light, this is probably our best hope at figuring out how to stop the virus and is by far the safest way to do this, um, to do anything, yeah, that's involving viruses. So you've got viruses which transmit in the world around us. You can go down to McDonald's and probably pick up a virus with your quarter pounder, you know. <laughs> Just because if there are 30 or 40 people in there right now and it's in the US, chances are one of those has the virus. And uh, yeah, spend long enough, near enough, breathe in enough, take your mask off and adjust it enough, and sure, that virus can be yours. So there are terrible experiments like this that happen in the world and you're not allowed to do anything like that in a laboratory. People are really afraid about what goes on in the laboratory because I think they're not in there. And they're, they're at McDonald's, they're looking around, they're saying, well, yeah, maybe that guy, you know, coughing over in the corner is really sick. But um, yeah, I, it's easier to process that risk because it's a familiar place and you're familiar with what's going on there. Um, I could take you through the precautions that have to be taken. I've been writing up lists of standard operating procedures. Oh my goodness, yeah, have I? Um, and essentially, yeah, to have the sort of contact that you could have at McDonald's for the price of a cheeseburger, and I don't want to beat up McDonald's. I like McDonald's, <laughs> yeah, so whatever. Burger King then, fine. They're actually okay too. Um, to do that sort of thing in a laboratory, you would have to have a thing called a powered air purifying respirator, which is like a gigantic bike helmet that goes down here under your chin and is filtering out with these really good HEPA filters all the air that comes in and essentially creating an airproof um, little shield around your face, like a little, uh, little bubble that you're in. And it's got like a power cord that you can put down in your pocket. And so that's going to take care of what you're breathing in. Now you've also got to watch out for what could get on you. Because if you splash some on you and then you go into the changing room or whatever and take off your little uh, mechanical bike helmet, yeah, there's going to be uh, a risk of exposure and you cannot have that. So you're going to have um, usually some kind of secondary containment. So it's going to be something like scrubs or maybe scrubs and then, well it wouldn't just be scrubs, it'd be like scrubs and a coat, some sort of lab coat that is um, waterproof essentially. And um, yeah, oftentimes like when we were working with lots of SARS coronavirus 1, we would have secondary sleeves that would go on over our regular sleeves just in case. It never happened, but in case you did get something on your sleeve, you could rip that thing off, you could put those things in a ball, dunk them into the uh, bleach tank that you have right there next to you in the hood, and yeah, you are then safe and you're okay. You normally wear two pairs of gloves, like a pair of gloves inside and then another pair of gloves over it, so that if you get anything on the outer pair of gloves, you can pull that off in a hurry and bleach your ethanol the heck out of it and boom, discard, get rid of it. Because anytime that there's even a chance that anything might be going wrong, yeah, it is your job to deal with it, kill that virus, yeah. That is uh, basically the first rule. You are surrounded in one of these places by really strong disinfectants. Things like Vircon, things like uh, you'll make up a fresh 10% bleach solution every time. We used to have a giant tank of formaldehyde, literal tank of literal formaldehyde. It was like a, I don't know, maybe a 25 gallon tank. And when we wanted to take something out, we had to, yes, if we had a poking stick and you'd, you'd sit your plates or whatever in there, fill them all up nice and good. You don't want the air pockets. Uh, and then sort of stir them around with the stick in this soup and leave them there overnight uh, in formaldehyde. And yeah, that kills <laughs> any coronavirus and any cell and anything. Yeah, <laughs> lucky we didn't kill ourselves. <laughs> and all 
Category 3 labs are like this. Um, at Category 2, you don't have to take quite that crazy amount of precautions. Um, uh, category 4, you have to take far more yeah, precautions. Just, you know, they're not ridiculous precautions because each one of these has a very definite reason why it's there. But, oh my gosh, yeah. Contrast that with the amount of personal protective equipment that you have to wear in order to order a pizza at Domino's, yeah, or Pizza Hut, yeah. Or the amount of personal protective equipment that it takes to place your coffee order and then sit there and drink it, you know, uh, uh, at an outside table with a bunch of people at Starbucks, yeah. The answer is uh, none, or maybe a mask, but you're allowed to take the mask off, so, you know, why is it there? <laughs> right. So, all right, so that's that's the first bit. And this is, uh, is going to be longer than you want, but um, I think it's worth going through. Um, let's see. So then the second thing, so uh, um, your question, which is a good one, which is one that's it's coming up uh, all over the place and you just asked it very directly. And so I like that. Thank you. Um, it's talking about work at UNC. So this is Ralph Barrick's lab and uh, yeah, he's got a lot of funding yeah, for coronavirus work. Um, I don't know, he's kind of uh, notoriously hard to work with uh, in that he really does not like to share stuff, but he does some great things there too. And honestly, he's a net big positive, I think, uh, for the field. Um, uh, and uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology comes up in there. Yeah, and everybody, ooh, everybody furrows their brows when they hear that. <laughs> but it's fine. These are both very large, well-funded, yeah, um, places where category three level work can be done, where it's approved uh, to be done and is done. And there's a range of procedures. They're a little different in every country. So, you know, what you would do in one country, you may do something a little more stringent or a little less stringent in another country, but it's going to be in the same ballpark. So, yeah, these, these are all definitely in the same category, and I would feel reasonable um, working at any of them, I think. So the talk is that they did these things called gain-of-function experiments, which, when you hear about it and you're not in virology, you say, whoa, gain-of-function. That seems like, you know, putting a, <laughs> putting a scorpion tail onto a gun, and now it's like a scorpion gun or something, you know, or a chainsaw gun, like in that one dumb video game. Yeah, it, it just seems like you're cobbling together some kind of monstrosity that can only hurt people and can't ever learn anything from. That's not the sort of experiments that we're talking about. So examples of gain of function experiments. A lot of these coronaviruses are only known from RNA sequences because they were found inside the poo of bats or other animals. And poo is full of digestive enzymes and bacteria and all kinds of stuff that is generally not very conducive to getting out an intact, still infectious coronavirus. But you can often find kind of like, you know, it's probably got all the, sh the spikes shaved off, but you, you can find something like the core of a coronavirus and you can open it and you can read out what the RNA says. And that tells you what the virus was. Yeah, <laughs> it's now no longer there. People have tried very hard to actually grow some of these because we know they are out there and people want to know, can these viruses actually infect human cells? So one thing that's been done in both of these labs is that you can take a virus that you know is able to grow in human cells. So a, a coronavirus has in the vicinity of 30 different genes in it. And there, each of these genes is going to interact with other parts of the virus, but also with some parts of the host cell. Um, and so the ones that are good at growing in humans will need to be able to interface with different parts that would be found inside of a human cell. And the ones that are great in chickens or pangolins or bats or whatever have to be just as good at interacting with the bat, pangolin, chicken, frog, whatever version of those. So what happens a lot of the time um, is that you can take this virus out, you can get the entire sequence, you can try the various ways to put it into a cell, but often it won't boot up. And you won't get a virus and so you won't be able to study it. A dead virus, you can look at it and you can't really do much more. You want to be able to try to grow this thing and make it work. So what people have done sometimes is to make chimeras, where they'll take the whole virus from one thing that we know grows in human cells, and we will swap out one little piece um, with a different one. 
and we'll take from the dead virus a little piece and put it in there and then we can see okay on the background of a functional normal virus what's it do if we put in the spike of this one this will tell us if that other coronavirus probably could have got into a human cell won't tell you if it could go through the entire process of replicating itself but it's getting in is the first start yeah um, and so experiments like that are the only way that we know that there are I don't know, something like 25% of the SARS coronavirus-like viruses out there that are actually able to enter human cells. That's something that we couldn't have known if we were trying to grow the viruses because when you find the viruses the first time, they're dead and you can't do anything with them. Another gain of function experiment would be adapting a coronavirus to grow in mice. And so if we want to study SARS coronavirus in mice, that's great, but SARS coronavirus doesn't really infect mice. So you have to either change the genetics of the mouse, like we talked about uh, in one, I think, uh, last week, or you can change the genetics of the virus. Um, and um, for a long time, we didn't know how to change those genetics. So you would just try and put the, the virus onto mouse cells or like a mix of mouse and human cells until the virus changed by itself enough that it could actually get into the mouse cells. And then you take that thing and now you can actually grow it inside of a mouse. Now, when you adapt the virus to grow in a mouse, it becomes much less able to grow inside human cells. It's kind of a one or the other thing because the protein it's trying to grab is different on a mouse, just a different shape than the one on a human. They're close, but not quite the same. And yeah, it takes a different kind of spike to go into one. So it's gain of function in the sense that we have a virus that wasn't able to grow in mice, but it now is, but it's also loss of function in that this virus now poses no real threat in regular cells. You still have to work with it though at the same level of biosafety as the parent virus. And in some cases you would have to work with it at a higher level of biosafety as the parent virus because there are unknowns. So, yeah, gain of function experiments are not what people think they are. And it's never as uh, sort of black and white, uh, easy to define as that. Um, I don't know of anybody who has gone in and tried to deliberately make a virus more dangerous. Um, yeah, that's just not something that <laughs> anybody would do. Because you're, you're risk, you, you work, it takes a lot of years and a lot of expertise and a lot of hard work to get to a position where you can actually work in a lab like the one around me or like uh, any of these others. And you would be throwing all of that away instantly, yeah, if you did something dumb like that. And yeah, that's just not why we're here, yeah. The scientist's goal is to try and understand something. Uh, you, you, yeah, w people tend to think of the mad scientist in the skull-shaped mountain who's, you know, got bullied in junior high or whatever and is now going to destroy the world. Like, that's what scientists are, but it's, it's not. It's, yeah, it's not like that. Um, so, yeah, gain-of-function experiments aren't what you think. Um, these places, and frankly, any place where you're allowed to grow SARS-CoV-1 or 2, is just ridiculously secure and safe compared to any other situation that a normal human would be in in the world. You always have more protective equipment, more layers. And it's not just about protecting you. It's a, There are layers built in there about how are you going to protect so that none of this goes down the drain, so that none of this gets into a mouse that then breeds with a wild mouse population, and then boom, you've got mouse SARS running around outside. You've got to have these things approved and scrutinized, usually every year, with random visits from safety goons, yeah. And honestly, that's for the best. That is how seriously we take this in the virology community. It's... Um, takes a ton of money to even be in a position where you can start to learn anything meaningful. And I think this is the most important stuff that we can do with the virus. We can try to understand what it is and how it works. And we do that by growing it.
um, yeah, any experiment where you're trying to um, where you're trying to show a new antiviral works. As part of that experiment, you're going to take a little bit of virus and turn it into a lot of virus, and just hope that the drug can stop it. You know, in some of those uh, some of the little flasks where you try it. But you could define that as a virus amplification experiment, even though that is definitely not the purpose. Um, I think this is just uh, yeah, people that aren't very close to the situation, armchair quarterback, and essentially um, stuff that yeah, it's just it's part of a different world that people don't often get to see. And so, I don't know, this has been a little bit long, but I, I've tried to bring you a little bit inside this world, uh, at least as far as we can in the office here, um, so you can see kind of what it is. Um, but uh, yeah, that's why I'm not particularly concerned and why I think in general news stories or uh, whatever, social media items that talk about uh, this sort of stuff, they're usually, they're basically repeating third and fourth hand rumors where nobody in the entire telephone game really knew what they were talking about. That's the way it looks, uh, at least as far as I can tell. So, I don't know. I'm hoping that helped, uh, yeah. Um, and thanks. It's actually a very good question, and I appreciate you bringing it up. This has been Ask Dr. Ben.